Okay, thanks for hanging around. Um, <laughs> I hope we're still really, really energized from the day. Um, before I begin, I just really wanted to thank uh, Code for America Summit, uh, UKGov, and um, the, of course, the International Design <laughs> community for being here and for just bringing me up today. Um, once again, my name is Maureen Akano and I currently serve, I'm a public servant, pr a proud one, and I currently serve as the design director for the Mayor's Office um, of Economic Opportunity in New York City. Um, I just wanted to sort of kick it off with a couple of these things, these photos. I just, I really wanted to um, Feel like we, I feel like we really need to be reminded of where that wherever we are, even outside these doors, that there's something something going on, right? Um, Oakland and the Bay Area, in general, they've had their own deep roots in social justice and civil rights. Um, from the 1960s civil rights movement, where citizens were fighting anti-discriminatory laws for issues like fair housing. Um, to being the home of actually the Black Panther Party, which offered the first uh, free breakfast program long before the federal government even did. Um, where Fruitvale BART Station, probably a, what, 10 minute BART ride from here or so, just two stops away, was where Oscar Grant III was shot in 2009 and probably became one of the earlier rallying points for what later became the Black Lives Matter movement. And just earlier this year, um, our Oakland public school teachers went on a strike demanding a salary raise and also um, additional hiring of school counselors, psychologists, and special education teachers. So really for decades, people have been voicing their needs to government, be it right here, right outside this hotel, or in New York City. And as public servants, it's our duty to listen and to respond to those needs. Um, but to listen and respond to them long before people turn to protest or striking or long before lives get lost. Um, I come from this community. I come from a community background um, and you know I'm actually from the Bay Area so it's really nice to be back here um, talking uh, in front of all of you all today. Um, you know in my earlier days um, I'm not so young uh, but you know I really thought about what about getting into law or urban planning or maybe even Eastern medicine or something like that? And but you know, really, I gravitated towards the creative making space and ended up shifting towards design and teaching design before I knew designing and government was even an option. Um, so you know, I think you know Emma was talking about this earlier, but less than a decade ago or more. Um, Design, we didn't have, design institutions didn't have programs or degrees focused on social impact even. Um, it's only recently actually even uh, the part, uh, Parsons uh, New School just launched a civic service design minor, um, or they will be in the fall. And so these things weren't there um, a decade ago, um, but now we're seeing these spaces being carved out for people like us. Um, and so, you know, we weren't, we weren't here talking like this, amplifying the apparent need for design and government, but here we are, here we've been today. Um, and if it wasn't for folks like the folks in the UK or other pioneers who have really carved out spaces and resources and learnings for us, we wouldn't be here at this point. Um, and I would say that this is just the beginning, right, for all of us. Um, so the New York City Mayor's Office um, for Economic Opportunity or NYC Opportunity for short, we focus on using evidence-based research um, and innovation to decrease poverty and increase equity in New York City. Um, our service design team is part of this kind of 70 plus uh, team uh, um, office um, and what we really focus on is bringing free resources to city agencies and offices and offer ourselves up both as um, consultants to advise on the practice of service design but we also work on um, providing ourselves as a part partner uh, with agencies to deeply work alongside them. We're a young team. Um, we've been around for a few years uh, but when official <laughs> in 2017 at the end of the year on average, because we do, we have um, design fellows and apprentices that are often on our team and f about four core. This is the size of our little team of humans. Um, and as you can see by these bubbles, we've got 8.6 million residents in New York City. 
Um, and we are trying to tap into the over 300,000 public servants and 125 plus agencies um, that New York City has. Um, so we've, as you can tell, we've got a lot of work on our hands, um, but I'll also say to that that we really recognize that and we know that we can't do it alone. So we're working really hard to not only do the work, but to build the capacity of our public servants um, so that they become equipped with the design mindset, the design methodologies, and those processes in a comfortable way so that they can take the practices that, that we know and, and do it on their own. Um, so of those 8.6 million people, our NYC Gov poverty measure, which comes out of our office every year, tells us that, if you can add, I'm not good at math, that's why I ended up doing design. <laughs> no, that over, um, that over half um, of our residents are in poverty or near poverty. Uh, poverty is quite a wicked problem, and to tackle that, we've got to learn to understand all the complexities that cause it and prevent it from uh, people from being liberated from it. Poverty has multiple inroads, and that means getting to, you know, how, how do we help get people to a stable place that often requires, um, and, and often, you know, getting folks to low income folks to a stable place means that they have to interact with one or more agencies or programs. The problem there is that those programs and agencies, um, sometimes even divisions within agencies, aren't always speaking to each other, which means service delivery is often siloed, and the requirements to receive those services often grinds up against um, a person's everyday life. So our agencies are either not realizing this or, for various reasons, um, not taking the uncomfortable steps to ask constituents why something isn't working or how things could be better. And I think our team really aims to change that. Um, so a couple of short stories that I can talk about where poverty, um, where, where uh, the work is really straining and complicated, uh, the services are really straining and complicated for our users. So for example, in our Pathways to Prevention project where we worked with the Administration for Children's Services, you've got families like Runa's family here where they're confronted with things like struggling to escape an abusive partner, dealing with school truancy or aggression or anxiety from the older child perhaps, trying to hold down a new job, all, also whilst trying to gain or sustain eligibility for childcare, for support for her newborn, um, housing support, public transportation support, cash and food assistance, all of this happening while someone like her is also asked to be taking part in additional um, ACS services. Perhaps those services are far commute from her home, um, and she's trying to do this all alone um, and to just keep her family strong and together. She represents one of these tens of thousands of uh, cases handled by ACS uh, every year. There and you've got someone like uh, Will here who is not necessarily a resident but is a caseworker who works for the Department of Homeless Services. He's a frontline caseworker who probably gets paid under $45,000 a year. He supports individuals who seek shelter daily. Um, right now, there's over 63,000 folks um, seeking shelter. About a third of them actually are children. Um, if you can imagine his life of having to take case management and doing other administrative duties, but also having to meet these folks um, coming to shelter every day, um, seeing them come in with their plastic bags or being coming in um, extremely stressed um, and coming from a bad situation looking for not only just public benefit support or housing but just mental and emotional support too and day in and day out having to, to deal with that is also something we have to recognize that our service providers are also um, impacted by that type of trauma of interacting with um, these vulnerable populations and so we have to be really mindful about how we build safeguards in place for them to decompress and self-process um, because what happens is high turnover, high stress, and we lose um, these types of folks that we so need in government. Um, and so part of service design is working with them as well and finding solutions for them and um, helping them, helping us also realize how can we build in um, client-centric ways of having someone like Will be able to support uh, the residents out there.
Um, in our latest project, actually with the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice and the First Lady, we learned that most of the women detained at Rikers Island Prison Complex are mothers. Um, in 2016, I believe, um, over about 500 to 600 women are detained uh, daily at Rikers. Um, about 79% of them, um, estimated in 2016, uh, are mothers. Um, so you can imagine sometimes when someone gets detained or arrested, the first thing that maybe if you know a mother wants to do is know where their children are. And it can be often hours or maybe a few days before they can identify where their kids are, who, who's under, who is taking care of them. On top of that, um, trying to understand what supports are available for them on island, when are they going to get out, if they get out, where are they going to go home to, is their job still there for them. Are there public benefits if they're on any? Um, are they still uh, available to them? These are the kinds of stresses that a woman like her faces. Um, and so we, you know, we are trying to build solutions for her to, to understand that system and build a continuum of support for someone like her. So moments like that, moments like these three sort of stories that I shared with you, and these are three real stories um, of people that we have researched and talked to. Um, these, you know, these folks, over them hangs like a, a cloud of life complexities aggrava aggravated by these sort of government inefficiencies, policy roadblocks, and stigma. <coughs> um, so when you can imagine like one agency trying to, you know, provide a service to a user um, and compounded with their daily lives or several agencies who aren't talking to each other trying to support these people in their daily lives you can imagine how complex and difficult it is for them. These folks that we design with are challenged by the systems that unintentionally keep them in poverty, and then when the system flaws happen over and over again to these same people and to the same communities, actually, that leads them to believe that government isn't reliable or listening to them or on their side. And so these folks represent some of the tens of thousands of New Yorkers um, going through similar struggles. And we really believe that if we really want to create accessible and dignified services, government has to zoom out and recalibrate themselves around the holistic, real lived experiences of our users. And our team has been spending a lot of time chipping away at the system mindset and um, have learned a few things from that. So what we believe is that a real lived experience is just as valuable as a policy degree. So bringing our users into a conversation early and often is in, in real ways is important to understanding the delicate and nuanced challenges to increasing economic opportunity and bettering the quality of life for these folks. We believe that our users, the individuals, the youth, the families, the elders of our city are agents of change and a key to larger transformation. So bringing them into the research is key. We, we literally right ha now have a woman named Tamanika who works for our children and who you know, provides mental health support for those who are re-entering, um, who who's working with us on a uh, criminal justice project right now. So she comes in and um, we call her a design fellow as well. So she's learning a lot about um, our methodologies and our practices. But what, we, what she really is to us is a checkpoint and someone who, who really keeps us in check with our work um, and lets us understand um, our users in a deeper way. Um, so she's there sitting with us right now. But we also bring providers in uh, when we can to develop our service provider contracts with us. So in an RFP process, this is a common thing that um, agencies come to us for. How do you design a better RFP process, a contracting process? And so when in those moments can we bring design in so that we can bring the voice of providers and users of those provider services early on enough so that when these contracts or RFPs are going out, that those voices are included in, in those RFPs. So we are really trying to take actionable uh, me like efforts to, to bring in our users into our research work and our projects. Um, we also believe that pe people's experiences and stories are evidence too. So like I said earlier, we're part of a team that has a program and evaluation and poverty research experts on the team to really, they help us kind of, their, their work really helps couple our design research work to enhance what we do, amplify what we do, and legitimize what we're doing. So those folks who are skeptics of design research can really trust um, the, the kind of 
um, work that we're doing. Um, but we really believe that um, the quotes, the stories, the insights um, that designers do so well at collecting are not adjacent to the evidence-based research. Um, the evidence, you know, the these stories are in themselves evidence too and serve as additional guideposts in steering our work towards the right interventions. So how we collect this information and couple that uh, with the evidence-based research is something that we're shaping right now with our team. Um, and that's like something that we're working on for the year is, you know, we've never really done deep co cross collaboration across our NYC opportunity team, but we really understand that if we can really crack the nut on what that framework could be, how might we be more innovative and you know more efficient for our users? Um, design is going beyond empathy, right? So we all know like sympathy, eh. empathy, yeah. yes, right? <laughs> but more deeply is actually being an ally to transform um, our insights into action. So we really need to stretch ourselves to be those allies. Um, but not get too bogged down by, because when, when you get too deep, sometimes it gets too personal. So balancing that out is important, but real action, we need to take real action that can really rejig systems and provide better outcomes. We, we, know, we have to know that we aren't here to just let people know that we're listening to them. That does very little on its own. Um, what we're here to do is to, um, what we're here to do is really to show and make real change that can be seen and felt by our residents and measured by our skeptics. So our team, when possible, does not take on a project without establishing an agreement or a SOW with our agency partners to prototype and identify where in the system a real commitment can be made. We're kind of anti-report, so we don't want to end with a report that no one will ever read. Uh, we're, we're deeply committed to saying if you're going to commit to working with us, then you're going to commit to making a solution for your users, and we will sit with you side by side to strategically find out how we can implant that into your agency so it's adopted and built, um, and we will handhold you if we need to. If you've never dealt with product or anything before, we will be there to make sure that happens. Um, so that's something that we're, we're pretty committed to. So design is really powerful. It gives government the confidence to really fight through the complexity that's often jading and exhausting the longer you work here. Um, when you can get people out of their seat, um, like literally out of their seat, you're, you're making a difference. Like I have been in rooms where we've tried to do co-design or tried to do a synthesis or some type of you know meeting to talk about the work we're doing and everybody's just sitting around that conference table and you're like let's stand up and put some post-its on the wall and no one moves and you're just like how what why <laughs> yeah. you know and then it was like they're glue on the seat or something like that but but really you know, once you can actually get people moving, and, and really, Sharpies, Sharpies and Post-its are actual magical tools that get people excited, they're colorful, they, you know, they harken back to our childhood a little bit. You know, those types of things actually are the, are the initial spark, an easy spark to create change, to show people that you can work differently. And so we've really seen that des de design can ignite and invigorate um, a government space that um, often sometimes, you know, people seem exhausted and burnt out in. Um, what two of the kind of more concrete ways that I think that we're doing this is one, we offer these civic design forums that happen every other month, which attract a full house of about 50 to 70 folks every single time. We partner with our IT uh, team, do it, and um, right now a new partner, um, the city planning labs. Um, and those, we bring folks to the table who are design curious, who are doing design, who are doing product development in the city to kind of share all the different projects that are going on to meet like-minded folks, but also to network and understand what are the common problems that are happening uh, across the city and who else might we need to talk to that, that are also tackling the same problems. The other one that we do to really invigorate uh, folks is our office hours. So. Um, we offer four office hours, one hour office hours every week uh, where any agency or office, individual or team can sign up and come talk to us. Anything from what the heck is service design? Can you explain that to me? To, you know, I have an actual more detailed problem and coming in um, to talk to us to talk about how to solve that. 
a lot a lot of times people call those therapy sessions um, and <laughs> and and it's it's great I mean in a lot of ways because we meet a lot of folks and can really um, match make one agency's problem to another because a lot of folks are struggling with the same problems um, but they just don't realize that other people are, are struggling with those same problems too um, Design, big thing is design gives us the permission to ask why, right? It gives us the tools and tactics to do our jobs better and to have the conversations that ignite change. So when we can sum up the research and come back from a field testing or you know field research and tell the agencies the stories that we've heard, lay those artifacts and ideas out on a table, those design artifacts will draw our colleagues away from assumption, draw people away from like, an end goal that has no research behind it, perhaps, and keep them focused on the user. So design lets us really ask why things are the way they are, and they challenge the status quo. It challenges the status quo. Design also just creates common ground across um, for our, our users and our colleagues. And we've, we've witnessed that most often in our co-design sessions. We might bring an assistant commissioner in at the same, in the same space as a provider or you know, a junior staff member and putting them at the same table, asking them the same questions and asking them to ideate on um, solutions together really flattens a hierarchy in a safe way and lets everybody voice their opinion. Um, and so that's something that wonderful that we've witnessed in the city. Um, a well-known designer, I think Koi Vin said it probably really well, is the key to successful creativity is preserving the notion of possibility. So when government is built on rules and rules upon rules upon rules, horse blinder mentality sets in. Um, but I think design gets us out of that. Um, and as I said earlier, users are a key to wider transformation. So it's not necessarily that it takes so long to talk to our users um, and so you know a lot of times people are like do are you guys spending too much time doing the user research and talk going out there in the field and finding out what they want and need you know shouldn't we focus more on on scale and proto getting into prototype quickly I think that's kind of a misnomer I think that what it, the problem is is that it takes so long administratively for us to go out and actually talk to them so our internal pro approval processes are often is what delays or prevents us from going into the community um, and our fear actually of not really having spoken to them directly kind of thwarts us sometimes so we have to really help colleagues get over that and show it's a necessary part of getting to the right solutions. Um, some of the asks I would have of government uh, <laughs> is that you need to give designers more time and space also. Uh, making is very important to us, that's part of our practice, right? So um, that's what we're trained to do. So if you want scalable solutions, you've got to give us the time up front to discover what our constituents want. Um, and not tell us to find a way to get them to use a product um, that you heard that works elsewhere. But you also have to try, if you can, give us the space to put up our boards, to put up our post-its and our synthesis work because not only um, is that necessary for us to like pull ourselves away from a computer or a piece of paper, but there's a design osmosis that happens when you have these things in an office and people walk by and see the products of the, or the progress of your work. Um, so it's super important that we can do that or at least hack a space or just take it over uh, with, um, to, to enable um, our creativity to really flourish and be uh, visible and transparent. Um, also, you know, if we want to do government right, we need to learn how to speak to our users again. So as designers, we do it often, but it can't be just us. So, you know, because like, you know, we, we, you know, um, how, what was I going to say? I have a story to this, actually. That's a better way to go into this. Um, when we worked with Administration of Children's Services, uh, some of you were in my talk earlier, but we um, encountered families who had visceral reactions to being in the same room as an ACS person who might not have even talked to them, but the fact that they knew that an ACS person was in the room at the same time um, would trigger crying, would trigger dad saying, I just, I'm just so stressed that I'm in the same room as this person right now. And, and when we realized that, um, one, we realized 
that we need to be more trauma informed about the research that we do, that we need to train ourselves up better so we can approach these things um, uh, in a better and more informed way. Um, but the other thing is that what we learned is that you know agencies don't often go and talk to those direct users themselves. They'll often go through their providers or assumption. They'll just make their own assumption. Um, but it's really important that we get to them um, because they're really like as I've been saying this entire talk, um, they're they're an, an extreme important part of um, getting us to the right solutions. Leadership also really matters. Um, we're really lucky to have um, an executive director and a deputy executive director and a whole team that supports service design and our practice. Um, it's only allowed us to just do our work more efficiently um, and having that permission um, has made things just so much easier for us and just less time trying to advocate for why we need to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I really have to give credit uh, to our leadership for that. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to say also that being able to couple the learnings of this sort of hyper-local approach to a successful model of scale only amplifies <coughs> what we as designers can do for government. It's not really an either or, I think it's both. Um, at the early life point at where we are with the service design studio, our strategy really is to chip away against um, at agency mindsets. Um, and to really be present enough to provide like that design osmosis that I was talking about, um, and so that's something that we're seeing um, that we're that uh, is emerging right now and that's working for us. Um, I kind of wanted to end with this. Um, I think that government was, you know, we all know government was designed intentionally or not intentionally, um, but knowing that, I think we have to remind ourselves that it means that it can be redesigned, and so. <laughs> So shifting the configuration of government to enable it to respond to wicked problems is what we're part of. And if we know anything about ourselves as designers, it's that we love figuring things out. Um, being design obsessed means that we are solutions obsessed and uh, what, place, what better place to get to do that. Um, so I kind of wanted to leave you with that, but I also just wanted to, you know, at the end of the day, just kind of really leave you with this question of like, you've been here today, you've learned, new things or you've really discovered that some of your, the folks that are in this room have similar kind of pain points as you do. Um, maybe some of you are not in government yet and thinking about it, but I just kind of really want to ask you all like what, what's your next step? What do you want to do? You know, how do you want to be more effective in, in this space? We need you. If you're not here yet, we need, we need more folks in government. Like I said 10 years ago, this wasn't a thing. But as you know, Jen was saying, 50% of the, the designers in government are probably in this room. Um, so, and and we've, got, we've got a lot of work to do in the US. So I'll leave with that. Um, thank you for having me.